Greetings and welcome to Small Business CEO TV. My name is Gwen Garns and I'm your host and I'm also the founder of Small Business CEO. In this segment, we give you, our audience, an opportunity to get to know some of our members both personally and professionally. This is your chance to get to know them as you get to know their businesses. And I can tell you today is going to be a little bit of an unusual topic and a little bit of an unusual approach to the show. As you can see uh, already, there's a, a little bit of a difference in the set for today's purposes. We'll explain this later, and I can promise you there's a very good explanation for it. So without further ado, I want to welcome Dr. William Flip Clay, the constipation coach to Small Business CEO TV. Dr. Clay, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you, Glenn, for having me. So again, this is a very... Uh, important topic, but we're taking it from a very light perspective. So we're going to be serious, but we're going to have some fun with it as well. Absolutely. Now, before we get into the actual subject matter that you cover as an expert, I want to start by getting your story, your personal story. So why don't you start by telling us where you're from and a little bit about your background growing up. I grew up in um, Hopewell, Virginia, 30 minutes south of Richmond, Virginia. I uh, lived with my father, my mother, my sister, and myself. My mother and my father, you know, typical family um, and then next thing you know there was a lot of abuse in the marriage when, my, when I turned nine my mom decided to leave my father and at that point she was diagnosed with carposal sarcoma skin cancer oh my she um, eventually died when I was 13 from there I was raised by my grandmother um, matriculated to job corps once uh, completing job corps I attended West Virginia State University transferred to Virginia State University and and com graduated from West Virginia State University, Virginia State University, and then completed my doctor doctorate degree, Argosa University American School of Professional Psychology. I've been a school counselor approximately 18 years, speaking on the national circuit of probably about 12 or 13 years. And I, now, so so as a school counselor, um, what, you're working with students one to one. Is that absolutely mm -hmm. in the group setting, one on one, and also working with the parents. Okay, what, what is the subject matter that you cover with the group, with the students, as, you know, as a professional? Um, just it's typical family, family issues, divorce, um, molestation, incest, rape, um, anger management, to topics of that nature. It varies. So in your profession, in your primary, because again, you, you, your, your coaching business is something that kind of grew out of what you were experiencing in your uh, original calling. Uh, as, as, a, as a school counselor. Absolutely. So, you, so you've been dealing with people that had a lot of emotional baggage over the years right from the beginning of your career then? Yes, yes sir, absolutely. And that's when I, the whole concept, I developed this whole concept back in 2008 and people thought it was a little out of the order, very, very different. Yeah, but it caught their attention, didn't Not it? Not only caught the attention, but you could see the results right. from the young, the young people I was working with. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. Tell us a little bit more about what you know. You said your childhood, obviously, you know, you lost your mother very early on in life. Um, I'm assuming that it wasn't uh, an easy transition from a two-parent household to a single-parent household. Did you learn anything from that experience? Yes, I did. I learned a whole lot. Um, I recall when I was 10, when I was 10 sitting at a table, and my mother told me, promise, promise her two things. Never treat a woman like your father treated me and make something of yourself. Because I had to go through that whole stage of from, from the age of nine to the age of 13 of taking care of her in her last days. Mm -hmm. In my book, I talk about the stories, the things I went through, what she went through. And because that was my story, that, 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 that's the diary of the, that's, that's the diary. Sure. So, so and we're going to get into this again a little bit later, but you're both a lecturer. You lecture on the subject matter that we're going to discuss later, and you also have, you're, you're a published author, on, a writer on that subject as well. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yes. So after you transitioned out of high school and went on to college, was there any specific college experience that you wanted to share or anything memorable <laughs> that, yes. that you could share in mixed company? <laughs> um, when, when I was in college, I went through this stage, well, after, around that time, I went through this stage where I started self-reflecting back on some of the behaviors of my father. And I became what they, I became what you would call a pimp. Mm -hmm. um, and I had, at that, at that point in time, I had about 14 individuals per se working for me. And I tell the story in my book. And they was pretty much. Oh, you mean a real pimp? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. And, and not really a pimp per se where they were out, well, 14, the name of my crew was America's Most Wanted. 12 men and two women. Um, 
and pretty much I would book clubs and throw parties and people would come watch them perform perform and after one after have after after two years I after one year I gave up working with the two young ladies the two ladies because my conscience started bothering me mm -hmm. um, I stopped thinking about what my mother told me understand what my mother was going through and one of the young ladies who was a stripper she, at that point in time she was raising a son and I started thinking about my mother and how could I consciously, you know, keep, use, keep, keep this process going from that perspective. That's where I was mentally. Mm -hmm. So self-reflection actually moved you in a new direction where you became more focused on adding value to someone's lives or to people's lives and not putting yourself in positions where people were being taken advantage of or abused in, 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 in the context of your interaction with them. And absolutely, and then a year later, I met this young lady I talk about in the book, who gave, she, she said to me, if you, wanna, if you wanna date me, you need to give this life up. She was deep into the, to the church. Okay. So eventually, I gave it up. I threw the last party, of course, but. <laughs> you I, always I, have that last, that the, last the hurrah, last hurrah, right? Yeah. Hurrah. But, but, but that's an important thing because a lot of times people stay stuck in their way of doing things because they don't think that it's going to be worth it to move in a new direction. And you made, so you made a very important decision Correct. to move in a new direction with your life, which has opened up all kinds of possibilities for you to help people in ways that you probably weren't contemplating back when that was your lifestyle. Absolutely, I, I wasn't. I mean, I, if you would have told me that what I'm doing now, I, I, it would mm -mm. because I was going through that stage. But I'm glad she came into my life. I think sometimes as men, we we have, we have this fence up, and we're unwilling to put the fence, you know, to let that to put the fence down. That's right. So, so in this context, two women, very influential in your life, right. caused you to stop and reflect and move in a new direction. Right. And that's why it's so important for us to have women in our lives, right? Uh, right. For reasons beyond what we normally th have grown up thinking right. women were for. Yeah. And this is my first time ever thinking about it from that perspective. Yeah. And yeah. I want to say thank you because I never looked at it from that there perspective. There you go. So, um, so, so again, that's an, that's an important concept of, you know, uh, the positive influence that women played in your life and, and your willingness to be open to receiving the teachings and their input and their feedback as opposed to just putting that aside and let it be something they said, but not something you heard. Correct, correct. Good deal, correct. good deal. Right. All right, now I am like dying to get into this, this subject matter that you offer uh, today. But I do want to find out, I, 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 this is not a gotcha question, and I think you probably already answered it, but you'll see in a minute. I normally ask people, tell us something that most people don't know about Dr. Clay. So <laughs> the, the pimpster, I don't know if you're going to beat that one, but go ahead and see if there's something else that most people, whether it's an interest that you have, an experience that you've had in life, or, or something that you're planning on doing. Just share something that most people don't know about you. When I was 10, my grandmother, she, you know, of course, she, she was, after, when my mother passed, my grandmother, she became my mother, and she was deep into the church. I, I can recall walking down this particular street called King's Court, and people who are from Hopewell are familiar with this street, and the deacon pulled up in a van, and he was drinking Budweiser, I, I still remember, and he tried to snatch me up and throw me in his van. Wow. And this is one of the deacons from the church who was very close with my grandmother. Interesting. And, and I pulled away and I just ran, and I never shared this with my grandmother because of the simple fact that she was so in love with the church that I felt and the like the respect she had for the deacon. And I felt like she would never believe me. That's the power of the church. Sure. And I felt like I never t said this to her. And um, I talk about it in my book, and I'm, and I'm just thinking if he would have been successful in taking me away, where would I be today? Exactly. And, and more importantly, how did he think he was going to get away with that? I guess a lot of people don't think about that right, until after right. the fact. But I still, I still see the white van, I still see the boat wise in his hand, and I still see him, see him stepping toward me to try to pull me into the van. Wow. And then the following Sunday, he's sitting up in church. Wow. What a, what a, what a paradigm shift that must have created for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It left a little bad taste in my mouth. Sure, yeah. sure. I can understand why. Yeah. Now, you have chosen to focus your attention from a professional standpoint in your, in your speaking, and in your group coaching, you have chosen to focus on a very important topic, and you have primarily worked 
with boys and men in this topic, probably because of the the the, the, the common experience that you've that, that you're able to share with them. And you've got a very unique perspective on how you help them to deal with this issue. Why don't you tell us what that issue is? Well, back in 2008, I noticed one thing about work. At that point in time, I was in the, working in an elementary school setting. And I noticed uh, young boys were having a hard time expressing their emotions. And it was causing so many problems academically, emotionally, and socially. So I started to say, okay, how can I get them to understand they need to release? Because I was seeing, when I was looking at them, I, was, I, was, I could see myself in them. I was like, wow, okay, how can I get them to understand? They have to talk about this. And I just happened to be um, in the bathroom one day. And I was like, man, this felt good. You know, I, something, I had eaten something and it just, but when I released it, it felt good. And I was like, wow. So I kind of like, from that standpoint, I, I didn't, I developed the concept, emotional psych. It's a non-diagnostic disorder. So that means it's not in the medical book. And I call it emotional psychological incarceration. So what I was Say that again for us. Emotional, emotional psychological, psychological incarceration. Got it. So what I was finding, the first stage is I call it emotional constipation. And that occurs from birth to the age of 14. If you don't address the constipation, your emotions go into an incarceration. And that occurs from 14, from the age of 14 into adulthood. If you don't address the in emotional incarceration, if you're an African-American male, usually you become physically incarcerated. And it's usually caused by trauma. So what I was finding with our young boys, the parents arguing, divorce, separation, was to them that was trauma. And they were shut down and act out. And, and I, I suspect that part of that is the same reason that you chose not to talk with your grandmother about your experience with the deacon there's probably some fear behind whether you would be believed in talking about these things. Right, and, we're, and, we're, and, we're, and, and as young males, we're not taught to express our emotions. That's right, we're taught the direct opposite, that it's a sign of weakness, weakness. for you to share emotion. So if I would have went to my grandmother and said, well, you know, this, knowing how she felt about the church, that, that would have been a tough sale. Yeah, not to you would have probably been the one to be punished. Right, not to say she wouldn't believe me, but it would have been hard for her to fathom that a deacon could actually attempt something that, that, that degree of that nature. Right. All right, so you've got emotional constipation turning into emotional incarceration, mm -hmm. and when you bottle up all of those emotions too long, it starts to cause you to act out in ways that ultimately result in your expressing yourself, you know, by violating the law and being physically being incarcerated. incarcerated. So if you look at the number of African-American males in prison, and, and I've spoken in various, audi I've spoken to very audience, aud audiences and individuals in the audience who are locked up. After hearing my lecture and reviewing my book, they was like, if I would have had this book, this probably would have saved my life. Because now I understand why I was acting the way I was acting. Not only why you were acting the way you were acting, but also that what society taught you about keeping your emotions to yourself was the direct opposite of what was in your best interest. Correct. And so that was my whole concept behind the book, The Constipation Coach, just introducing the concept of counseling with a twist. And I call it constipated conversations. There you go. There you go. Now, of course, we have this very special prop here, which is symbolic of your entire approach, right. which is helping people get over the emotional constipation that they experience. And, and I, I suspect that this starts off with a curiosity Absolutely. in the audience. And also a little giggle, a little laugh, a little, right, little humor right, to it. Right. And that probably opens them up a little bit. But how, all, how else, what, what is the thing that gets, your approach, how is it that they get to start feeling comfortable with just opening up and sharing their experiences? Well, I, I share this analogy. And it's, it's basically sometimes when we, you know, when we consume a certain food, it, you know, we eat it, it, it doesn't agree with our stomach. And the only way to release it is to sit on the toilet and to let it out, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, and sometimes I'm sure we've all experienced sitting on the toilet and releasing a good one. Mm -hmm. and, and it felt so good to let it out. And I guess a lot of people probably are uncomfortable even talking about it in that term right. until you gave them permission to look at it from that perspective. From the perspective that when you sit, when you eat something, you consume something that doesn't agree with your stomach and you release it, how do you feel? You feel good. So the question I ask, individuals, 
what is it you've consumed emotionally that you haven't released, but you know if you release it, you're going to feel it's better. It's going to make you feel better. And the green light just pop on. Wow. So, you, so basically you gave them, through the lecture, a conversational laxative that gave them permission to release right. all that emotion that had been pent up. Yeah, to them. start the conversation. Excellent. To, to, give them, to let them know it's okay to release it because you know you're going to feel better. And no one can argue with the, the concept that when you release a good one, you feel good. Yeah. I mean, you can't argue with it. We don't talk about that. We don't talk about it. And we don't talk about it, especially in mixed company. Right. But the truth is we are all thinking it and all experiencing it. Right. All you did was made it okay to talk about it. Right. And, and I mean, because somebody's going to sit on the toilet and they're going to be like, whoa, that felt good. And when they're thinking about transitioning that feeling into releasing their emotions, you now have, again, given them permission, permission. To, le to release the societal conditioning that they've been given and having all that bottled up inside them as if they're not allowed to be able to let it go. And it's, and it's very easy. Now tell me about some of the people that you've worked with, because you were, you were mentioning that this approach you've gotten some rather dramatic results and some r r dramatic feedback from people in the audiences that you've spoken before. Yeah, I've, sp I've spoken, I, have, I had the opportunity to speak at various churches, universities, colleges, um, several high schools around the country. I, I can recall one particular story. It was a 16-year-old young Latino girl, um, and after speaking and watching the video, she called me to the back and she said, thank you. And I was like, okay, thank you for what? She said, she said, now I understand. I talk about a story in my book. Um, it was a 75-year-old man. We were just having this conversation in front of the store, Brown's Market. And um, I was breaking the whole concept down to him. Three weeks later, he came up to me. He said, thank you. He says, now I understand why I've been so angry towards my wife and my three daughters. It happened to me when I was 12. When I was 12. And he talked about what happened to him. Mm -hmm. He was like, man, I never really even thought about it until I had the conversation with you. I mean, it's, it's plenty of very, I mean, more success stories. Um, when I started the concept back in 2008, I started my empowerment program in elementary school. The program was so successful, we ended up being on the Steve Harvey Morning Show. Wow. And they ended up interviewing the president of my organization at that time, who was constantly in trouble. But because of the development of this program and understanding the concept and giving them a safe haven, to, to, to release those unfiltered emotions. Sure. Academically, socially, emotionally, I had over 55 young men become very successful academically. And they're, oh, they are adults today, and they still reach out to me to say thank you. Well, I'm gonna say thank you because I was drawn to you in this topic largely because obviously as a male growing up in a society that conditions you to hide your emotions, I found it to be both a attractive way to call attention to a topic that needs to be addressed in a very big way. And you had, you've created a very light, uh, you know, keeping it light, but keeping it a real, keeping it real approach to it. Because even though it's a serious topic, right. it does help for you to start the conversation off with something that makes people comfortable, makes them laugh. It, it makes them uncomfortable because they're not used to the idea of even talking about it. But you give them permission to have that chuckle right. before they really turn their attention to the emotional baggage that they're carrying. And then they start to realize that in that company, it's okay for them to release that too. Right, and to take that next step to healing. Exactly, exactly. And so I love your subject matter. Thank you. The subject matter is not unique. I mean, you've got people who are experiencing emotional trauma because they've got it bottled up inside them. They don't feel they can talk to anyone about it. And they're actually taught not to talk to them yeah, about 70 it. 70% of Americans. Exactly. 70%. Exactly. So it's not the subject that's unique. It's the approach that you've taken to address the subject. And, and, and we love that uh, about what you're doing and the work that you're doing. And that's why I really wanted to have you be able to come and share that. Now, now, you've, now you also share that in a variety of different ways. You're an author, so you've written a book about it. You encourage people to get the book. I don't, I, I don't know. I think people have to get that book. Yeah. The Either. Diary of an Emotionally Constipated Man. Yeah. And what makes it so unique, there are case studies and my personal journey. So the case studies will be applicable to the general population. My personal story will be applicable to males in general. And see, that's the other thing is that you have written a book telling, addressing the subject from your perspective, what you've been through. So you're automatically bringing yourself into alignment with people who are um, experiencing these things because they see, through, they see through your journey that they're not unique. And the case studies also help other individuals see, them, see themselves in the journey. Absolutely. 
Well, it's, it's clear that you've given a lot of thought to, the, to how to best address this to get the maximum result for people who are struggling with, the, with these issues. And one of the things we didn't talk about is how often all this emotional baggage causes people to self-medicate with illicit drugs, you know, drug, you know, drug addiction, leading right. to more, more, more likelihood of being incarcerated either through crime or, or drug use or, or, or other alcoholism. Things. Alcoholism as That's well. That's why I talk about the Remy bottle and the Patron bottle. There you go. Right. We, we, we drink to hide our pain. Right. It's, it's a matter of numbing it because we don't know how to deal with it. Right. Right. And, and, and again, that's just another wonderful uh, and, uh, example of how your impact is showing up, or your, your ability to impact the community is showing up in all kinds of ways. And, and I'm just happy that we're going to be able to take this out to the masses and show people that you're in a position to help them with something that they have may, may have been struggling with all their yeah. lives. And hopefully intervene early enough with younger, younger people, younger boys. Correct, ladies. absolutely. Because even though I know you work primarily with, boy, with boys, uh, boys and men, male, male, uh, male uh, people, um, you also don't exclude women. The subject matter is the same for everyone. No, absolutely, because I mean, right, yes, right, because we have the same, we have the similar issues. It's just that young ladies are taught to release their emotions and the boys are not, males right. are not. So my goal is to help everyone because sure. we're all constipated emotionally. Sure. Absolutely. And some of us physically constipated. So we need the laxative. That's right. And, and I'm you've the got it. You're the laxative. I'm the laxative. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Be sure, to, be sure to incorporate that into your, to your lectures and everything. I'm sure you're already doing that. Yeah. But right. my, my point is that um, sometimes being able to address a very important issue requires you to step back and to do it in an entertaining way right. to attract people to you so that they listen more intently to your message. Yes, and you have absolutely perfected that with the with this prop of the toilet. And, and I'm telling you, this, this, is, this, this is just a, an amazing way to bring people's attention. I, I, I suspect you don't get a lot of people just walking by and not stopping a little. Oh, What's stop, going oh, on? Oh, oh, oh man, it's, Glenn, you, I could tell you stories, man. The toilet is powerful. Mm -hmm. The toilet is something else. It's, it's, I love when I set up to speak and I usually have it covered. Mm -hmm. And when I remove the cover from the toilet, you can, the, the, you should see the faces of, in the room. But by the time I finish, the whole atmosphere has changed. Yeah, they understand the connection between the humor right. and the important subject matter that you cover. Yeah, especially for men. Uh, um, I've, sh I've lectured in front of several men, and, and you, uh, ladies, you will, you, you, it, I, I wish you could just be in the room to watch the response. Because it's like, it's funny, but now they get hit in the face. Yeah. But they, it's but a wake-up call, but right. in a very good way. And, they, and, they, and, they're, and they're safe to say it's okay. Mm -hmm. I've had several men walk up to me after my session and just shake my hand and say thank you. Well, on that note, I'd like to give you an opportunity to get in, for, in front of more of those men, more of those boys, and, and, and more of the audience. So let's tell people right now a little bit more about the different ways that you are able to serve them. I know you do lecture. Correct. You speak in front of organizations and, and uh, businesses, any, anywhere that you can go where someone will invite you to speak. Absolutely. I also know that you do group, group coaching in the sense of, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a lecture format, but you have groups of people that come together, almost like a, uh, a boot camp or weekend intensive type thing. Right. So you've got that available. You've got your book available, okay? Yes. And I know that you're working right now on preparing to work one-to-one -one with those people who might like to have that one-to-one -one personal attention with you. Yes, the first year I'll be launching my coaching program, Constipated Conversations. Um, the podcast is going to be launching probably end of this month, 1st of October. And that's, that's a video podcast a as video well. Video podcast. Right. So actually, it's going to be the concept of um, Fix My Life and Dr. Phil. Fantastic. But I'll be the chocolate Dr. Phil. <laughs> I like that. I like to think that Dr. Phil is probably the white chocolate version of you. Okay. That's how we got to put that. You know, you, okay. You, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not second fiddle to him. Although he's, he's, he's accomplished quite a bit and inspired Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You can give him his props on that. Right, right. I mean, you know, yeah. you, give, you, know do, do, you can give you a do. But he, he looks, be you look better in a bow tie than he does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll be the chocolate version. There you go. The there you go. Version. So, so this is what I'd like to do right now. I, I want to tell the audience how they can get connected to you because again, You've got a lot of different resources that are available. Let's talk about how they can get connected to you. Uh, the website uh, for, for you is boysoffthehook.com. That's www.boysoffthehook.com. And on that website, I think that you told me that they can get on your mailing list. Yeah, they can go to which, con contact us, get on my mailing list. 
And, and, that, and that, of course, also gives you an opportunity for you to follow up with them Correct. And, yeah. and give them other insights into the programs you're developing, where Correct. they can plug in and all right. that kind of stuff. They, want me, they like to contact me for me to come out to speak. So I want to encourage you first and foremost, ladies and gentlemen, go to www.boysoffthehook.com. Join Dr. Flip Clay's mailing list so that he can keep you tuned in to all the different ways that you can get plugged into the resources and information that he has available for you. He's got his podcast coming up. You may be watching this at a time when the podcast has already been launched. Maybe the coaching program has already been launched. But go to the website, get on the mailing list so that you can be notified. And when, that program, when those programs are in place, I'm sure he'll be sending out an announcement and giving you an opportunity to plug into those resources. And the book's available right now, am I correct? Yes, and go to my website, boysoffthehook.com. It's on Amazon, um, okay. The Diver of Emotionally Constipated Man. It's a must-read. It's questions at the end of each chapter for self-reflection that could be utilized in a group setting. Well, it sounds like it's more of a workbook. So yes, it's it, not just let me read this and set it aside. Right. You've got some action items for them to work yeah, through. Yeah, action items. Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah, self-reflection is good. Self Fantastic. Is good. Fantastic. All right, so we've already explained to you where you can get connected to Dr. Flip. Uh, and, and his full name is Dr. William Flip Clay, but he prefers Flip, right? That's fine. That's so, fine. so the bottom line is you'll hear me flip back and forth between the two. Uh, no pun intended there. But let me also tell you that you can get connected to Dr. Flip also at expertsonstage.com and also on our main website for the TV show, Small Business CEO. So if you go to www.sbceo.com and you click on the, state of the, the uh, member map, look for him in the state of Maryland and you will find that uh, he's going to be an incredible resource for you. But definitely take the time to get connected. This is a person that has a lot of insight into some things that are possibly troubling you or someone you know. So if it's not you, it's going to be someone you know. Get people connected to Dr. Flip Clay so that he can help them release their emotional baggage with his wonderful personal <laughs> laxative. And uh, again, you know, this is a serious topic, but we try to keep it light. Right. But for somebody, you will be making a difference either for yourself or somebody else by being, a, being sure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Clay to the people who might benefit most from what he knows. So Dr. Clay, I want to thank you for joining us on well, Small Business CO TV. It's a pleasure it. to have you. I know pleasure. that we're going to have another conversation because you're also going to join us on the radio show at some point in time where we're going to get a little more deep into a topic of interest as opposed to simply introducing you to the community. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're gonna have we're gonna have some more fun together. We had to figure out where to put this in the radio room, but gonna, <laughs> we will figure that out. You know you know that I will. Right. And so on behalf of Dr. Clay my name is Glenn Garns. I want to thank you for joining us for this, uh, this episode of Small Business CEO TV. We'll look forward to seeing you again real soon.